Like, uh, congratulations are in order. You have made it past the year 2020. All right, so it was it was looking a little bit shady there for a little while, uh, but you guys have uh, officially made it there, and so uh, congratulations. I feel like there's been more anticipation uh, for the year 2021 than there has been in quite some time. In fact, it's probably the biggest uh, New Year celebration that I can think of ever since the year 2000. All right, uh, I don't know if uh, for those of you that are not old enough to remember the year 2000 and New Year's Eve, we thought the year 2000 was going to be what the year 2020 actually was, all right? Uh, we, we thought everything was going to shut down, the computers were going to like destroy itself, there's going to be chaos in the streets, and apparently that all just waited a few years uh, to the year 2020, but, but we have made it into the year 2020. I remember back in the year 2000, I was, I was just a kid myself, but uh, we had, uh, it was the, the pinnacle, the peak of technology, Windows 98 on our uh, on on our computer, man, it worked like a dream. Uh, and, and my parents, I, I remember they, they wanted to make sure the computer was still going to work after New Year's. Uh, for some reason, we thought it was all going to shut down or whatever. Um, and so they, they brought in a computer guru to come in and, and, and take a look at it. I just remember watching him, and all he did, he sat down, he looked at the clock, he clicked on it on the bottom right-hand corner, and then he typed in January 1st, 20, 2000, and they hit enter, and he changed the clock forward, and nothing happened. And then he was like, all right, you guys are good. <laughs> like, that was, and then, then he left. And I was like, that was it. Like, we could have just changed the clocks on our, all our computers and know everything was going to be right. Uh, but back then, we were kind of, uh, you know, scared of what was going to happen whenever we crossed into the year 2000. Uh, now, I, I think that there might be still some fear, still some apprehension. But by and large, we're optimistic in it. We're, we're saying, man, I hope that year 2021 is going to be much better than the year 2020. I, I hope that all this mess, all this craziness, all all the sickness is behind us and we can move forward. And I find that there's a lot of people that are putting their faith and hope and trust in the year 2021. And let me tell you something, 2021 is going to let you down. <laughs> Just like 2020 did, just like 2019, just like 20, 2018, and every single year, it's going to let you down. That's why we don't put our faith and hope in the year that's upcoming. We put our faith and hope in the one that never changes, the one that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? And so that is what we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, we're gonna, the title of today's sermon is uh, How to See the Miraculous in the Year 2021. 20, um, but more than that, we're starting also... Um, we're starting also a series to the book of Ephesians. Now, you might say, but I thought he just said to turn to the book of Acts. I did, all right? So, uh, but, but that's all right, because what we're going to be doing here, normally whenever you start a series uh, through a book, like what we're going to be doing, it's going to be a longer one, several months probably. Um, but uh, who am I joking? Of course, it's going to be that long. Um, but... Uh, what we're going to do instead of, oftentimes whenever you start a sermon series like this, the pastor gets up, and the first sermon is always kind of boring uh, because he comes up, he's like, well, Ephesians was written to the city of Ephesus, and it was a big city, and they had Jews, and they had Greeks, and they, he kind of like goes through all the, the stats and the statistics about the letter just so you have the background material and all that stuff. That's not really my uh, style, my favorite thing to do. And so what we're going to actually do is look at, for this week and next week, we're going to look at how the church at Ephesus actually started. Because we have the record, we have how Paul went into the city and actually started the church, and I believe that if we understand this a little bit better, whenever we read through and study through the book of Ephesians over the next several months, uh, then we'll be able to properly understand it better. And we can kind of trace back and draw a line back to say, you know what, I wonder if he said this because of what happened whenever the church started. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 18 here. But before we get going, let me pray one more time. Father, we love you, Lord. We, we need you uh, right now. We need you to meet with us. We need a word from you. And so, Lord, I pray that it's nothing that I, I can say, but only your words are remembered as always, Lord. And um, Lord, as we come here and we celebrate your goodness, uh, we're not remiss to remember some of our um, family members and friends that are even struggling with sickness right now, Lord. I, I pray that you would just be protecting them, guiding them, giving them comfort and peace and healing them. But Lord, for us that are in this room and watching online live right now, I pray that you would just especially meet with us. Give us the word that you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to be starting in Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Acts 18, verse 24. 
4. And it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. All right, well, we'll stop right there for now. Now, uh, officially, Paul had been in the city of Ephesus one time before, uh, but it was a quick visit. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over to where uh, the story kind of really starts to get going. It starts with this man named Apollos. Now, we don't know a lot about him. He just kind of shows up uh, a couple times here in Scripture, and that's kind of all. A lot of people think that eventually he wrote the book of Hebrews, but that's another conversation for another time. But we don't know just a lot about him. But what we do know here from these verses is that he was uh, ultimately a good preacher. He, He was he knew what he was talking about. He was competent in the scriptures. He knew the, whenever it says scriptures in the New Testament, it's talking about the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament extremely well. He was from the city of Alexandria, which was one of the uh, major libraries, the Alexandrian library in Egypt. A lot of Jews lived there. So he was there. He probably studied a lot. And so he knew it. But more than that, he was eloquent. He, he could speak in such a way that people would be convinced of it. He could speak in an eloquent way that people were attracted to it. And then further, they're all he was fervent in spirit, meaning that he would get up and he could passionately display exactly what he wanted to say. And so, so this man, this man was like the Billy Graham before Billy Graham's got here, all right? He was a, a passionate, strong preacher. He knew exactly what the scripture said and he knew exactly how to convey it in a way. There was only one problem here, and that's the last line there. It says, though he only knew the baptism of John, though he only knew the baptism of John. Now, that's John the Baptist. If you remember, um, and if you know the Bible well, you know that John the Baptist came before Jesus, right? And he was baptizing people. And sometimes we get that question, like, why was John baptizing people before Jesus? Well, it's called the baptism of repentance. Basically, they were still looking forward to the Messiah coming. They said that, you know, the Messiah is coming and we're going to repent of our sins. And so we're going to be baptized for this looking forward to the Messiah that is coming. And that's all he knew. Probably what happened here, he's from Alexandria in Egypt. He probably came up to Jerusalem at some point for one of the feasts, Passover feasts, saw this one, another guy that was also fervent, uh, knew the scriptures well, heard John the Baptist preach, and he's like, man, this guy makes a lot of sense. I should believe him. And he believed him, and then he left, not knowing that Jesus was like right behind him coming. Because I don't know if you know this, but in the year like 30 or 40, um, there wasn't Facebook yet. <laughs> and so here's the deal. Like if you left Israel um, and you didn't come back, you, you wouldn't know about Jesus until somebody walked to that city and started to tell other people. Right. And so he had heard up to the baptism of John. He probably even heard John the Baptist himself would be my assumption. I can't prove, but he probably heard John the Baptist himself saying the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And so he was now looking for the Messiah, but he hadn't yet known that Jesus had come himself. And so he comes, he's a great preacher, he's convincing a lot of people. But then in verse 26, it says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Priscilla and Aquila, an older couple that's also mentioned a few times in Scripture, they did exactly what they were supposed to. They heard him. They saw this passionate young preacher uh, that, that was preaching accurately, except for that he didn't have the full context. And so they did what we all should do. They wrote an angry post about it on Facebook and really blackmailed him. Uh, no, they, they gossiped about him in the church uh, and then tried to start all sorts of disruptions. Or No, no, they did what they were supposed to. They went to and they pulled him aside privately. And that's what you are called to do. If you ever find, if you ever find I'm preaching something wrong, if you ever find somebody else in this church, whether they're preaching wrong or living wrong, uh, we, we don't go, we don't publicize that. We don't talk to other people. You just pull them aside privately. That's what Jesus taught. So they pull him aside and say, hey, man, I, I love what you're doing. I love what you're preaching. You, you got fire inside of you. Can, can I explain a little bit more? You're going to love this. And, and, and he was, and he was convinced of it. And so going on, verse 27, it says, when he had wished to cross Achaia, that's where Corinth is, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who taught, uh, who helped those who, through grace had believed. For he had powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So he went off to Corinth. 
But there's probably some people still that heard him preach earlier on that believed that the Messiah was still coming. And so in, verse, in chapter uh, 1 of verse 19, or excuse me, chapter 19, verse 1, it says, And it happened that while Paulus was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Verse 2, And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No. We have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. (laughs) All right, so there's a problem here. (laughs) Because he finds these people that are looking for the Messiah, that say that they believe that the Messiah is coming, and and then he's like, there's something off, right? Have you ever been in one of those churches? I I hope it's never said about this church. But you walk in, and you're like, well, they're reading the right Bible. (laughs) They're singing the right songs, but there's just something a little bit off in here. There's something, it doesn't seem alive. It doesn't seem like that, that, like we're all here. I'm not sure if God is here, though. (laughs) And apparently it seems like Paul walked in here and it's like, you know, there's something missing right now. There's something that's just not quite right here. We, we need to address this. And so he asked him, like, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we don't even know what that is, right? That's a problem. And so hopefully, though, if you're a Christian here, if you're not, I'm thankful that you're here. But if you're a Christian here, you should already know that we believe in one God with three persons, right? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That The Holy Spirit is an equal uh, part to God the Father and God the Son. And he's actually the one, whenever we believe, he's the one that indwells us, empowers us. Um, he's that one, whenever you feel the Lord is leading you in a direction, that's the Holy Spirit uh, on your life and dwelling you. And so, so we, we believe in that. Here's the deal, though. I find a lot in my walk that I come a lot, along a lot of Christians, and I'll, I'll be honest, there's been times in my walk as well um, where it's like, yeah, I believe in the Holy Spirit, but sometimes I act like I say, I don't even know who that guy is. <laughs> sometimes in my spiritual walk, in all of our spiritual walk, we, we come out and we say, yeah, I believe all the right things, but in reality, if you look at our life, we look like we're functional atheists, that we're trying to all do it ourselves, that we're trying to do it all on our own power. I was talking to a man a few years ago, actually, um, and he had some addictions of what he was looking at. And he was, he was, I was counseling him. He was trying to get over it. And he's like, I don't know what's wrong, Joel. He's like, I I got all the filters set up on my computer. Um, I I got accountability partners asking me. I limit my time online. He's like, I just can't get over it. I don't know what's wrong. I've got all these tools. I was like, yeah, have you prayed about it yet? (laughs) He's like, no, I I haven't. (laughs) I was like, well, you're trying to fight a spiritual battle with physical weapons. And so keep those physical weapons, uh, build those up, but yet you can never fight a spiritual battle with physical weapons. And you might say, well, my battle, it's not like that. It's a physical battle. There there is no physical battles when it comes to the kingdom of God. They're all spiritual, and we all need the Holy Spirit. And so so he comes here, and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They're like, oh, you don't know what that is. All right? And and so then he says in verse 3, and he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Into John's baptism. So John's baptism, once again, was looking forward to Jesus. They repented of their sins, but they were still looking forward. They did not understand the full gospel yet. Uh, And so the first point in your bulletin is this. If you want to see God do the miraculous in 2021, you have to fill up on the Holy Spirit. You have to fill up on the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 now. It says, And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So he clearly explains, he says, listen, you, you got baptized. Yeah, but, but that was a baptism of repentance. But, but John, he was, all he was doing, he was looking forward to Jesus. He was pointing to Jesus. And so for every single one of us, like we can repent, we can feel sorry for our sins. But if you're not looking at Jesus, it doesn't help you any. So he says, look at Jesus. And then at that point, they said, OK, we believe now. They get baptized for real. Paul lays his hands on them. And then when in the book of Acts, whenever the gospel went to a certain places, this is how the Holy Spirit came upon them. They lay hands on them. And then they started started to prophesy and speak in tongues, and I'm not going to quite get into that, right? Stay till Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll talk more about it uh, when, in our study here, but we're not going to get into it today. Some of you are like, oh, man, but uh, <laughs> some of you are thankful, um, but, but whenever in the gospel of Acts, at least, or the book of Acts right now, that the, whenever the gospel went forth, this was a sign that, that happened, showing that the gospel, that, that the Holy Spirit had come upon this city for the first time, and that is what 
That is why they were so thankful, I think. They were so thankful. Because do you remember the very first time that you believed in Jesus? (laughs) Do, Do you remember that time when you felt for the first time in your life the guilt, the shame, all of that be released? And and finally you say, no, 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 I have a relationship with the one true God. Do do you remember that moment? Do you are you not thankful to the person that introduced you to it, whether it was your parents, whether it's your mom or your dad or a neighbor or a friend? Aren't you thankful for the one that actually took time to, to shepherd you and lead you to that? They would love Paul. They would love Paul. There's 12 of them here, and they loved him. And then now, all of a sudden, they start to see these miraculous things start to happen. This church comes alive like never before. This church uh, that was kind of dead, that everybody could see that they believed the right things, but yet there, there was something missing there. All of a sudden, they started to come alive, and God started to do the miraculous here because the Holy Spirit finally came. And let me tell you something. As a church, as your life, as an individual, nothing miraculous is ever going to happen without the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. We need to draw into this. We need to run after that. Now, I'll be honest. Sometimes as a Bible church, we have a reputation. I hear it from other pastors. They're mean to me. They're so mean to me. I'm just kidding. But but they say the Bible churches, you guys believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. (laughs) That we kind of devoid ourselves. that That we dismiss the Spirit. And that ought not to be. That we need to be full of the Spirit. And the next point in your bulletin is this. It's not difficult to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. It's not just difficult to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. It is impossible. D.L. Moody said it like this. You're better off trying to see without eyes than you are trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. But yet so many of us, we set up all the systems. We set up all the ways. We set, we set up all the structure in order that if anybody looks at our life, it doesn't look like we're actually leaning into them. Like some of you haven't read your Bible this year, right? You're three days in and you're like, uh-oh, he's right. Some of you haven't prayed very much this year other than, God, thank you for this food. Amen. How is 2021 going to be any better than 2020? If we just keep doing the same old things, if we haven't leaned into the Lord anymore. Listen, we don't put our faith and trust in the year 2020, a new fresh start. That January 1st is just a day. The one who can actually change things next year is Jesus Christ and being indwelled in the Holy Spirit. And so we need to run to that. We need to embrace that. Now, we, we then come in and we say, OK, what does that look like? Are we supposed to all be prophesying and laying on uh, hands and speaking in tongues? Well, uh, we'll get into that later. But Ephesians 5, I think, actually gives a better description of it. Ephesians 5, this is what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. I'll just read it quickly. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Has anybody ever seen a drunk person? <laughs> Some of you saw him on Thursday night and in the mirror. Shame on you. All right. If you see a drunk person, everything about that person is consumed by the alcohol controlled by the alcohol, right? They, they, can't, they can't walk straight because they have alcohol controlling that. They can't, they can't think straight. They're singing songs that, that they shouldn't be singing, right? Because everything about them is controlled by the alcohol in that moment. And so Paul comes and says in Ephesians 5, he says, don't get drunk by wine, but being filled with the Spirit is kind of like that. Be completely filled with the Spirit. So everywhere you walk, it's evident that you're being controlled by the Spirit. Everywhere that you talk, you're being controlled by the Spirit. Everything that you're doing is controlled by the Spirit. So it's a kind of the opposite of being drunk, but you're drunk on the Holy Spirit. And it goes on and says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So apparently when you're drunk on the Spirit, you still like to sing crazy songs uh, because that's what it says. Verse 20 says, giving thanks always. So we ought to be thankful and infer- to everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. And so here's what the, here's what the image looks like. It's Somebody that's joyful, joyful. That's what being filled with the Spirit looks like. It's being thankful to the Lord. That's what being filled with the Spirit looks like. It's submitting and showing love and respect to one another around here. That's what a Spirit-filled life looks like. And next year will be absolutely no different unless you start to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you start to seek after this, if you start to chase after this. In verse 8, though, it goes on and says, And he entered the synagogue, And for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. I love verse 8 because it gets real simple and real practical. 
So he now goes into the synagogue, which was kind of like the Jewish church, more or less. He, he would go inside the synagogue, and, and he never abandoned the Jews. He, he always sought, to, uh, sought the synagogue first, the Jewish people first. So he'd always go into the synagogue, and he would try to debate and persuade. And, and what he does here, I think, is a good model for us. It says that he spoke boldly, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them. So first, he spoke boldly. He knew exactly where he stood. He knew exactly what was right and what was wrong, and he was not going to back down. We have a lot of Christians today. We have a lot of churches today that don't speak boldly about anything. (laughs) You can't ever tell exactly what they believe because they won't ever tell you. that they're, They're timid. They're scared. And so we need to be people that speak boldly, that know exactly what we believe and say, I'm going to stand on this firm foundation of the word of God, and I will not be moved. We need to speak boldly. There are also some... Christians, though, that speak boldly about everything, (laughs) but don't really have any reason uh, or intellect to follow it up, right? And we ought not to be that either. Just to speak boldly about things is uh, is not a good thing, but we need to be somebody that can speak boldly, but also reason and persuade. The idea of reasoning in the Greek is that it's an intellectual argument. That he's conveying something in a a persuasive way that that allows that argument to go forward, that people can understand and start to believe what is being said. And we need to be people that stand boldly, but also can be able to talk to people. um, A little while ago, I was talking to um, somebody uh, about abortion, actually, and they they were convinced that abortion was... um, was okay, that, that, that there was nothing wrong with it. And, and I found that um, just saying, baby murder is not the best way to go about that conversation. Which, by the way, in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have, um, I'm not going to do this, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the Sanctity of Life service right here in our church. It's in your bulletin. You want to mark that down and be here. Um, I'm, I'm excited about that community-wide service. But I was talking to this individual, and, and he, his argument was, and this, is, this isn't my words, this is his words. He was saying, he's like, well, I, I, he's like, I don't like it you know, later on in the pregnancy, but early in the pregnancy, it's, you know, their, their brain activity isn't what a human is, so it's basically like killing an animal. It's, it's not like human, this, this, his words. And thankfully, I had recently had a baby, and I kind of know a little bit about it. Um, I've had lots of babies. Uh, <laughs> Beth has had lots of babies. Let me be that. I'm going to get in trouble. But he said, you know, it's 20 weeks, he said. I'm, I don't want it. You know, after 20 weeks, I'm against it. But before 20 weeks, it's all right. But, but I said, well, what about those babies that are born before 20 weeks and live? Are they not human when they come out? <laughs> he said, well, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> right? Because we need to be able not just to scream and shout and say, this is right, because we might be right. But we need to be able to dialogue and talk and and listen to people and be able to come back with reasonable defenses and give them options, because we know that we're right, right? If we're standing on the word of God, we know that we have the truth. So we don't have to be scared of intellectual arguments. We can lean into it. We can fight back with that, and just like Paul did. So he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Verse 9, though, or excuse me, the next part of your bulletin is this, that we ought to live in obedience. We ought to live in obedience. Because look at verse 8 one more time here. He was doing exactly what every single one of us was called to do. He just went to church, (laughs) and he started to talk boldly to people. He didn't back down from Scripture. He he would go in, and he uh, he would share his faith with people that were unbelievers. Like, he wasn't doing anything special in this moment. He was doing the exact same thing that we are all called to do, every single one of us. And so if you want to see God do the miraculous in the year 2021, then first of all, you need to be filled with the Spirit, and then second of all, you just need to live in obedience to God. You need to live in obedience to God. You cannot do anything of value if it's not in obedience to the Father. And so he comes in here and he does just something simple that every single one of us can do. Every single one of us can go out. We can all be reaching our neighbors, reaching our friends. How many of your friends did you tell about Jesus this last year? How many of your coworkers did you have a conversation about Christ with? What's going to change this year? What can we do different? They'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and live in obedience to God. And so in verse 9 it says, But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, there's always some of those guys, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. 
So he was going in every single day, really, and, and speaking in synagogue, dialogue, discussing, uh, debating, and all of this. And, and then it says that some started to speak evil of him and speak evil of the way, which that's what they called Christianity back in the book of Acts, which is awesome. I want to go back to that. If you're a Disney Mandalorian fan, you talk about the way all the time. But, but that, that, this was the original uh, way. And so, so they were speaking evil of it. And so he's like, fine, all right, I'll just leave here, and I'll, he'll do what he always does. He left the synagogue, and then he went and started to talk to those pagans outside, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And he went to the Hall of Tyrannius. We, we don't actually know exactly uh, what that was, uh, but it was probably some type of lecture hall or maybe a school or, or, or town hall where people would gather, and they would meet, and they would dialogue and discuss. And so he would go there. It's, and some trans, uh, transcripts say during the afternoon, every afternoon, because in the morning he was also making tents. He was bivocational. He was just like you, just like me. He, was, he, was, he wasn't being paid uh, to be a religious leader at this moment. He would go in the morning, he would make tents all morning, and then he would leave his job and the work, go to the marketplace and just try to lead people to Jesus. That doesn't seem that miraculous, does it? That doesn't seem that special, does it? He was just living in simple obedience. That is what he was called to do, and that is what uh, God had for him. And so in verse 10, it says, this continued for two years. Two years. Paul was at the city of Ephesus longer than any other place once he became a missionary. He already spent three years in the synagogue, now two extra years. Like he, so two years and three months, and he probably, he's been there once before. Like, I've been here for two and a half years. That's nothing compared to uh, Pastor Carl, who was here for 35 years. But two and a half years, I feel like I know you guys pretty well, right? I've walked with some of you through difficult things. I prayed with you over uh, some of you have lost family members. We've done a funeral here. We, we, we have walked through things, and I, I genuinely love you. I genuinely feel like I know many of you so well. That's how Apostle Paul felt about the church at Ephesus. He knew them. Like, he, he knew their kids. He, he knew their names. He knew what they were good at, what they weren't good at. He knew their spiritual strength. He knew their spiritual weaknesses. So as we continue on through the book of Ephesians, we're going to see that, no, this is genuine love. He, it would be like if I left and I got thrown in prison somewhere in D.C., which might happen someday. I don't know. And I, I wrote you a letter. I wrote you a letter. Like, it would come out of genuine love for you because I know you. I've walked with you. And this is what... The book of Ephesians is, for two years, he remained faithful. He got up every morning, he went to work, he made tents. He went every evening and shared the gospel. That's all it was. But then look at this in the last part of it. So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, in all fairness, Asia isn't the same as what we think. It wasn't China and things like that, but, but it was a province in western Turkey is where the city of Ephesus was. And so it would be essentially like this in today's vernacular, our, our thinking. It would be like if the Bible said, Paul went to work every single day, and then in the evening he went to the town hall and shared his faith every single night, and all of Florida knew the gospel. <laughs> See, that's not miraculous. That's not special. That's not anything grandiose. That's not looking for some miracle. That is just him simply living in obedience. And that's the next point of your bulletin is that lives are changed through simple acts of obedience to God. Lives are changed through simple acts of obedience to God. Oftentimes we, we look at TV preachers, right? <laughs> we, we, we see all these miraculous things happen. We, we hear these stories. We read these books. And we say, man, if only something like that could happen. But let me tell you something. For the miracle that you might be looking for in 2021, it's probably not going to be in the miraculous parting of the Red Sea that we maybe want. For some of you, you've been praying for a spouse for so long that still hasn't accepted the Lord. Some of us, we have children that, that, that are rebellious, that, that, that won't come back to the Lord. And we say, I've been praying for so long, this is impossible. God is, like, I don't understand why God isn't moving. Those miracles that we long for are probably not going to be the Red Sea moments, but they're going to be through little simple acts of obedience 
They're going to be whenever your child walks down the stairs and sees you reading the Bible every morning. That's what's going to make the impact. They're going to, they're going to see the way that you, that you treat people out on the street, treat that homeless guy. It's going to be those simple acts of obedience actually change the lives of the people around us, change your coworkers, change your kids, change your spouse's life, the simple acts of obedience. So if you want to see God do the miraculous in the year 2020, be filled with the Holy Spirit and just live in simple obedience to him. And this last... This last part of the sermon, I'll tell you what, I love this story. I don't think I'm allowed to say this from church, but like, I actually like love what the demons do in this next story. <laughs> it's my favorite demon story, all right? So, so once again, I probably shouldn't say this, but, but like, if there's ever a time when I say, you know what, I could get on board with what those demons did there. Like, this is the moment. So I, I love this story because what we're going to see here is after Paul, after Paul lives in, the, lives in simple obedience, it doesn't seem like he's doing anything special. He's just literally going to work every day and witnessing. After that, we start to see God is going to do some miracles. God is going to start doing some stuff, and God is going to start to shake things up in a way that probably none of them have actually ever thought was possible. So in verse 11 here, it says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Notice first in verse 11, when it says uh, doing extraordinary, God was doing, God was doing, not Paul wasn't doing extraordinary miracles. That ain't up to us. It was God that was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So Paul was just simply the vessel. Anytime that God is going to work, it, we're just simply the vessel. We are the cause of it. He doesn't look down and says, oh man, they holy. I better give them a miracle. No, it's always the work of God. So God was doing it by the hands of Paul. And then it goes on though. It says, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. All right. This is, this is awesome, right? This is next level power. All right. So Paul, he was, a, he was a tent maker. He'd probably, every morning, he would go in and make some tents and do all that. Um, and then at some point, he'd take his apron off, right? Just leave it up there. He, he would pull out his hanky, leave it right there. And then he'd walk away, and somebody would grab it <laughs> and then run over to a sick person, lay it on him. And that guy's like, I'm healed. <laughs> like, this was next level power right now. Like, right in the year 2020, if you see a hanky laying around, you're like, I ain't touching that thing, right? Uh, but no, this was, this was actually, like, forget the Pfizer vaccine. I'm taking Paul's hanky all day. Right, And so he's, they're just going around and touching people, and there's that much power in him that God is using him so powerfully, so mightily in these simple acts of obedience that God is doing miraculous things. Now, this obviously starts to uh, spread around, right? There's probably a whole line of people looking to try to catch something. Of a, like he's a rock star or something, throwing out hankies all day. Like this was probably start to gather a crowd, gather attention here. And so that's what happens in verse 13, it says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to evoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. And so here we go, the itinerant Jewish uh, exorcist. <laughs> Those were the very first TV preachers, all right? Those were the, <laughs> those were the first guys that they, because back in that day, if you had a sickness, if you had something wrong with your leg, they often thought, well, there must be an evil spirit in it. So the, the doctors weren't that good. And so they would call in the exorcist to try to pull the evil spirit out. And so these guys probably made quite the living. And so they were Jewish ones. They would go around to all the Jews in the area and they would try to uh, get all the evil spirits out. But Probably Paul really cut into their business model in this moment, right? Like, who's going to go to these guys whenever Paul's hanky was healing people, all right? And so all of them, also, they were like, what do we do? Maybe let's go ahead and try the Jesus guy. Let's go ahead and try to drop his name and see if that helps. And so they said, once again, in Jesus, they, they, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims, is what they would say. <laughs> Clearly, they had no relationship with Jesus. They didn't believe in him. I, I drew you by Jesus who Paul proclaims. <laughs> It wasn't like who I believe in, who I have a relationship. No, but the, this guy, Paul, has a lot of power. And so I'm going to name drop him and I'm going to name drop Jesus. And hopefully something good will happen. And look at the next verse. It makes it even worse because it says seven sons of the Jewish high priest, Steva, were doing this. Number one, there are seven of them. Keep that in mind. There are seven of them. 
Number two, they were sons of a Jewish high priest. These weren't just Joe Schmoes that were doing this. Some guys on the, you know, with an online Bible degree um, that were doing this or something like that. But no, these guys were sons of the high priest. They were important. <laughs> they, they, they had connections here. And we don't actually know who that high priest was. He's not mentioned in outside of scripture. Uh, but if in that time period, if he was a high priest at some point, there's a good chance that he was probably on the council that voted to kill Jesus. They knew who Jesus was. <laughs> probably knew who Paul was. Daddy even probably tried to kill Jesus. And now they're saying, we, we should probably try to use his name to heal some people. Am I, it's kind of funny how that starts to turn, right? And so there were seven sons here, and they were sons of the high priest. They were important guys. And so they go to this evil spirit and say, by the power of Jesus, who Paul proclaims, I, I, I command you to come out. Look what the demon responds in verse 15. It says, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. And Paul I recognize, but who are you? (laughs) I love that, right? Because he's like, listen, the demon's like, I know Jesus. I was there when Jesus created the world. Like, I know I was one of those fools that followed Satan down to hell. Like, I I, I know Jesus. I know he's going to come back and rule and reign. You don't have to tell me anything about Jesus, what he's saying. He's like, and Paul, I recognize, (laughs) which I love that because that just means that demons are back here behind the scenes gossiping, right? Because they're like, I've heard about this guy, Paul. Like, did you hear what he did to Steve? Like, they just touch him with a hanky. And Steve got sent out from that guy. And so like, they, they, he's like, I recognize Paul. Apparently they were gossiping about it. They were like, here comes Paul, and there goes the neighborhood. We got to get out of here. So they said, we know Jesus. We recognize Paul, but who are you? <laughs> Listen, in all serious, a lot of us try to fight our spiritual warfare and our spiritual battles just like this. <laughs> We come at it thinking that we're saying the right things, doing the right things. I mean, there's so many of us, we all wake up and we come hit, the, hit the floor and we say, not today, Satan. <laughs> and Satan's like, who are you, Karen? Like, oh, I'll listen to you. <laughs> if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, empowering you, if you're not living in simple obedience, you have no power to fight any battles. And they were just here faking it. They were trying to say the right words. And maybe you're here today and you're like, I can sing the songs. I can look at the Bible. I can look spiritual. But you know, you know in your heart that you're faking it. And I invite you today to be like them and say, I'm going to believe. I'm going to put my faith and trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I'm going to put my faith and trust that he is risen again. I'm ready to be filled with his spirit right now. And then this next verse, it would be weird if it's your life first, but it's a good one. Verse 16, and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. (laughs) I've not been in a lot of fights, more of a peacekeeper by nature. But if there's one thing I know about fighting, that if you go into a fight fully clothed, and you leave that fight fully naked, like you lost the fight. <laughs> like, there, and there were seven of them, right? There were seven guys. There's one evil spirit. They all left naked and wounded and running out of there. <laughs> What's amazing about this story, this is comical to me. I, I think God has a sense of humor, and I, I love this story. But what's amazing about it is even in the midst of this, we, we can look at it and say, well, there's still an evil spirit. This is still bad. But God even used this story in such a way to bring him more glory than he ever got before, if, even if they would have sent that demon out of there. Because in the next few verses, it goes on and says, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, which was a huge city. Everybody heard about the seven sons of the high priest that got beat up and stripped down and sent out. They, they, everybody knew. You wouldn't want to be those guys. Both Jews and Greeks and fear fell on, upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled or exalted in a mighty way. And many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, so that the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. (laughs) 
So now all these dark magicians, which if you don't know, Ephesus was actually one of the major hubs for paganism. There were, there was huge temples, which we'll talk about later, but, but there's huge temples. Uh, this was a major industry. When it said in the previous verse that there was 50,000 pieces of silver, uh, that's the value of everything that was thrown into fire, that would be about $5 million in 2020. That's like all of a sudden, all the barkeepers, all the, all the uh, guys that own all those shops that we don't even talk about, like all of them, all of a sudden start to get saved. And not only do they get saved, they're like, I'm taking everything that I have and I'm just throwing it into the fire to burn because I'm a believer now. And this all happened and it had nothing to do with Paul. <laughs> Paul just left his apron and his hankies around is how this story started. People got healed. They got jealous. And God started to do miraculous things just because Paul was living in simple obedience. And for every single one of us, as, as Joel comes on up here, we're about ready to finish off. But for every single one of us, I think that the year 2020 probably had its struggles <laughs> one way or the other. I, I hope that you're healthy. I hope that your family's healthy. But there's a lot of stress in 2020. Uh, I know your stories, some of your stories, and I know some of the hardships that you faced. And we're just going to start to look forward into the year 2021. And we put our hope and faith, if we do anything else, without being filled by the Holy Spirit and without living in simple obedience, we will not be able to live any differently than we lived in 2020. Those same stresses will still be there. The same struggles will still be there. The last point in your bulletin is this. And the Lord will do awesome things. If you want to see God do the miraculous in the year 2021, be filled with the Holy Spirit, live in obedience, and then the Lord will do awesome things. He will come through. He always comes through. What are you hoping for in the year 2021? Well, what are you dreaming for? What are you longing for? What are the things that you said, man, I've been praying every day of 2020 for this. I've been praying every day for the last 10 years that my spouse would get saved. I've been praying every single day that my child would get saved. I've been praying every single day that the Lord would provide in this sort of way, that he would see, heal this sickness that I, I just feel like it's not, gonna, it's not ever going to go away. What are you praying for? What are you hoping for? This series that we're going to start today is called Greater Things. Greater Things. It's a series through the book of Ephesians. And the reason why I named it that was actually coming out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I wonder when Paul wrote that. If he thought back, it's like, man, I never would have thought. <laughs> I never would have thought about how all of Asia heard the gospel from me just going out and talking to people. <laughs> I never would have thought that God would have used this interaction with a demon to then cause mass revival among the darkest industry in the world. And so all of a sudden now, well, he, God did more than he could ask or think, even for the Apostle Paul. I wonder if he's saying, I hope they remember that story. <laughs> in the year 2020, I hope that you're praying for things. I hope that you're longing for things. I hope that, you're, that, you, that you have something here that you're saying, Lord, I can't, I can't ever do this on my own. It's only if you show up. And, and so today, I want us to go ahead and mark that down and stamp it. And so we have this bulletin board. We're going to move it out here in just a minute. As we start with our final song in just a moment here, as we start to sing the final song, there's these three tables up here. They all have cards on them, and they all have pens on them. And I encourage you to grab two of them, two cards, actually. And as the final song starts to play, you can come up here, you can grab a card, and it says, 2021, Greater Things Prayer, and it has this verse listed on here. The first card is yours. You keep this one. You put this one inside your Bible. You put it somewhere that you're going to see every single day. And you mark on it, what am I praying for? Something that only God can do. I ain't talking about cruise to Caribbean, all right? That, that ain't what I'm talking about here. That travel agent can do that. I'm talking about something that only God can do. That you have 
that maybe that child that you have been praying for for so long that doesn't kind of seem like ever change, that spouse, maybe it's somebody else, maybe it's the people in your workplace that you say, I can't go on one more day and something has to change that you know only God can do. You write it down. You keep the first one. And the second one, write it down, whatever you're comfortable with. You join what the first service already did and you put your card up on that bulletin board. We're going to hang this probably in the back of the sanctuary in the year 2020 because I believe that when we're people that desire the Holy Spirit, that live in, in light of the Holy Spirit, that live a Holy Spirit filled life and we live in simple obedience to the Word of God, that miracles are going to happen, that lives are going to be changed, that chains are going to be broken and, and this is going to happen. I believe it. And so for me in the year 2021, we're getting pretty full in here. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, we have two services. We can't fit everybody in one service. I'm praying. I don't know how God's going to work it out yet, but I'm praying for more space. <laughs> I'm praying for the resources to go ahead and start to build. I'm going to pray that that seems impossible to me right now because we don't have the money. We don't have the resources, but I believe that God can do it. I'm going to keep praying on this. That's what I'm writing on near my card. What are you going to write on yours? As the music starts to play, I'm going to pray. As the music starts to pray, you can come up at any point and write down, take a little pen, and put it in the bar. Father, we love you, Lord. Lord, I pray. Number one, that if anybody's here today, once again, that has not put their faith and trust in you, Lord, we know that the biggest miracle of all is coming from a dead man to a living person, <laughs> dead lady to a living lady. Lord, I pray that if anybody is in here today that maybe just came because they thought it would be a good idea just to show up to church on the first day of the year, that they would put their faith and trust in you and know that you died on the cross for their sins that they would not leave today without settling that. Lord, for every single one of us in here that's a believer, I know that we have many hopes and dreams. I pray that they're all, every single one of them, rooted in you. I, I pray, Lord, for all those wayward children that we've been praying for for a long time. Lord, I pray for those people that are struggling with sicknesses right now for a long time out of facing surgeries and unknown futures, Lord, I, I lift them up. There's so many things in our life, Lord, that we just feel like we don't have any control over. But we know the one who controls it all. And so, Lord, I pray that we commit to live a life full of you, that we seek after the Holy Spirit, that we live in simple obedience, and we put our faith and trust In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At any point, you can come and join me by putting your card on the computer.